So thanks, everyone, uh, for coming to uh, the first of several uh, UCAN talks. I, I think we're just going to call this now the, the UCAN track from, from, for the rest of the day, basically, because uh, uh, I'm up, then Arakli's giving a uh, tutorial, and then after that, talking about uh, IPVM, which is actually built on top of uh, a lot of this work. So uh, you can decentralize auth. Uh, in the UCAN community, we, uh, we really enjoy the, the pun, you can do this, you can do that. Uh, to kick things off, uh, Mark Miller uh, was, uh, well, or slash is, yeah, the, the guy who really came up with the modern conception of capabilities. So you can a, a capability-based system um, and goes way further than what most people think of auth, right, which is just login um, to the point that you can structure your entire application around it, right? And so we're, we'll touch on that a little bit in this talk, um, but just to kind of, you know, help free, free your mind a little bit from auth is login. My name is Brooklyn Zelenka. You can find me anywhere on the internet as Xpeed. I'm the co-founder and CTO of a company called Fission. Uh, you can find us on Discord, on the Protocol Labs network, um, uh, Mastodon, um, or all over the internet. Um, and I might know a thing or two about UCAN. Uh, I helped start the project. Um, I still do a lot of work with uh, the governance and standards uh, in it, though it's now uh, grown uh, well beyond Fission um, and is a fully community project. Um, and because programming languages and distributed systems are my jam, uh, capability systems are uh, right in the middle of that. So it's like it, the like exact sort of thing that, that uh, uh, I like to do. So um, let's get started. So uh, let's, why do we wanna do auth in this way and everywhere? It used to be that you had a beige box under a desk somewhere and somebody would log in and then they would log out and then the next person would come and they'd log in and they'd log out, and they want to make sure that, uh, you know, person A didn't have access to person B's files, right? And that's really how access control lists were born in the 70s. These days, uh, we have a lot of stuff, right? In, with different consistency levels, with different uh, distances to the user, um, we have commons networks, right? We've got stuff way at the edge, we have uh, computers in our pockets. It's a completely different world, and there's so many applications now that need to be able to interoperate and connect, and that today, you can do it, but it's way more painful than it has to be. So how do we actually get things to talk to each other in an easier, simpler, consistent way? When we started at Fission, uh, we wanted to always get to compute, uh, which we're now just starting to do, which is great, um, but to do compute, you need to do data, and to do data, you need to do auth, if, at least if you want to do data in production, right? Having everything be totally public and accessible all the time isn't a, really a production use case. It's good for some things, not good for a lot of things. So uh, with UCAN, we're solving this bottom auth layer. So uh, I think in, in IPFS generally, we're trying to power a new internet. And to do that, we have to think about how we're going to grow all of these technologies to impact as many people as possible. And people often get really worried about this idea of crossing the chasm, right? Of like taking it from early adopters to the early majority who have very different uh, needs and philosophies about things. But we're not even close to that one. We are, everyone in this room are this tiny little sliver called innovators. We are crossing that tiny little chasm there right now. And if we want this to grow, we need to focus on, on these people, the early adopters, the people that are just gonna hack something into a system and get it running and get it moving, right? We wanna bring all the nice security properties of capabilities and uh, decentralization, right? But we need to put it in a format and in a way that's uh, interoperable with how things currently are to kind of help drag people kicking and screaming into the future, right? Uh, I think it's relatively uncontroversial to say that uh, Web3 UX is too hard, just like in general, right? Um, so in order to meet this goal, we need to be easier, as secure, and more open than OAuth, X509, SAML, Macaroons, MetaMask, WallConnect, et cetera. Basically all the, all the other options, right? Now, I, I won't claim that we've uh, surpassed all of these in every possible dimension, but we're actually making pretty good headway against a lot of them. So OAuth is the, um, the big one, right, uh, that uh, everyone interacts with when you sign in with, sign in with Twitter, sign in with GitHub, all those things, you're using OAuth. This is a pretty typical OAuth uh, login flow. You have a user, 
the application that's asking for access to something, to some resource, an authorization server that actually controls the uh, access to things, and the resource server. The first phase is uh, the leftmost three coordinating on uh, can the application actually request the thing, and then these last few steps are actually getting the resource. And you have to have this authorization server in the middle because everything, all of the knowledge and all the information about who's allowed to access what is centralized in that auth server. Which then begs the question, what if we got rid of that? And we made it instead of a stateful protocol into a stateless protocol. It simplifies the picture quite a lot. It's really easy to reason about. We don't need an auth server anymore because the user is their own auth server. Uh, the application asks the user, can I have auth to the, uh, access to this thing? Can I have auth? Yep, here you go. And then it can make requests to the resource server. One way of thinking of the uh, approach that you can take in general is that we're trying to be a Trojan horse for Web3 into Web2. So building on widely supported, familiar, well understood standards and tools, things that are not cool, right, like JWTs, gets us in the door to bring these ideas uh, to where people are actually using things. So one example is uh, putting in a bearer header, bearer token header. UCAN is not a bearer token, right? It is absolutely an authorization token, but by formatting it this way, it automatically works out of the box with every web server out there and every front end framework out there. They just all work together, right? Uh, Newsphere's doing this, we've been doing this at Fission for a long time. It works really well. And another approach to things like this, right, because we, we try to be self-sovereign, and UCAN gives you a lot of flexibility and self-sovereignty. One of the things that we're trying to fix in there is when you have to run your own infrastructure completely, so you have to run your own IPFS nodes to do IPNS, for example. So this is great, you know, you can exchange messages with all the other peers in the network. Uh, you own this particular node, you can run it on your desktop, you own your own key. But the problem is, what if you're on uh, a device that doesn't have an IPFS node in it, or that's not currently accessible because it's, you know, it's asleep? Well, then you need to have somebody else run one of these things for you. So now there's users of a particular node who have to log in with some separate mechanism, username, password, something like this, to get access to the namespace that that IPNS node is managing. So what we've done by creating decentralization is actually created a point of centralization, right, ironically. The same thing goes for uh, edge and decentralized apps. Uh, if you need to keep a list of who's allowed to access things or who's allowed to do updates, you've created another point of centralization. The uh, sort of nice thing about this is that they're actually the same picture. They're the same situation. Right, so if we can solve for one, we can actually solve for the other. So enough preamble, let's actually talk about what a, a capability is. Broadly speaking, there's uh, two models. There's access control lists, which most people are more familiar with. And as I mentioned off the top, this is really uh, from the day of people will log in and log out, right? It's for sharing a terminal, one at a time. And it's since been extended to more things. Capabilities were designed from day one for networking, for uh, concurrent use cases, for many. ACLs are fundamentally stateful. So here's my user, here's some uh, service that they want to access, and when they make the request, they get stopped by uh, some guarding process. So this is a little bit like having uh, you know, a bouncer at the club who checks their list to see if you're one of the cool people and says, okay, yeah, cool, yeah, you're, you're on the list, and I'll forward that on to the service. The advantage of this is that it comes in three really clear stages, right? You can throw an auth server in front of basically anything, right? It's, it's totally decoupled. The downside is that these two are not in control. So if you either take control of this one or the service, um, you have access to absolutely everything. It doesn't provide the user or the service with agency. And we have all of the data centralized in this one list. So if another service wants to reuse this, they have to either synchronize in the back this list continuously, uh, or 
uh, make round trip requests always to the same server. Some of you might be thinking, well, that, that's really simple, right? You know, these days we have things like CRDTs. Um, the bad news is that CRDTs uh, don't express uh, ACLs very well, right? So not to pick on this one post in particular, but this is to say uh, uh, there be dragons. Uh, a lot of very, very, very smart people have tried to do a CRDT ACL. It hasn't worked. Um, there's a bunch of reasons, but just, you know, I'm, I mean, there's, this is a half hour slot. I could give an entire talk about this, um, but just as, as an intuition pump, um, the, uh, if you have, for example, uh, two admins of a system, so they can accept and reject people in, into a group, uh, and they have the power to reject each other. If you have a malicious one, it will immediately try to eject the other admin. The good admin will try to eject the malicious one, and nobody in the system now knows who to trust because you have an eventually consistent uh, CRDT, right? People have tried to tackle this problem at the user experience level and expose all of the, you know, uh, the gory details of that to the user. It doesn't really work out. Um, capabilities don't have this problem because we always root our authority in, for a resource in the resource itself. It always owns from, from the get-go. Um, uh, it can delegate out to who, who it wants to be able to access it. Capabilities have a slightly different picture. Here's the user, here's the service they want to uh, access, and the user has some address, some pointer to the thing, and a cryptographic token that says they're allowed to go and uh, access this. So instead of being like a bouncer in front of the club, it's like having a ticket to the movie theater. Right? When I go to the movies, they don't check my ID on the way in. They check I have a ticket, and that's it. If I can't make it, that's fine. I can give my ticket to Steven. Steven can go see the movie instead of me. Right? This puts the user and the service in control. All of the required info sits inside of the token. It's stateless. I can make copies of the capability and hand, hand them out to other people. I can attenuate them. And uh, I can share them with others so they can also access this. And you can do things with this that are actually more powerful than with ACLs. Uh, there's a, a really great paper called ACLs Don't that explains that uh, you can model anything in an ACL as capabilities, but not everything is from capabilities as ACLs. Right? It's a more powerful concept. The uh, compos composition of capabilities is interesting. The classic example of this is uh, I have a capability that gives me access to soup in a can. I have another one that gives me access to a can opener. If I just have the can, I'm gonna go hungry. If I have just the can opener, I'm gonna go hungry. But if I bring them together, I can get into the soup, I can have a nice lunch. To put this in more technical uh, terms, if you have access to a database and access to write, uh, to send email, you can now compose, read from database, operate on it, send email. But if you want to make the read or the write side of that something else, you can compose those together in different ways, right? So instead of being a database, maybe it's gonna read out of Filecoin. Instead of email, maybe it's going to post to IPNS. Okay. Now, that's a lot of detail, that's a lot of things that are unfamiliar, but off, fundamentally, should be just extremely boring. So this is uh, something we've had in production for a while. It looks exactly like an OAuth, uh, um, screen where you say, ah, I wanna give them access to these things, and then you get access to, in this case, it's basically like a, a Dropbox clone, right? I wanna give them access to my public files, my private files, um, uh, for this amount of time, yep, go for it. So let's actually look at one of the tokens uh, in detail. One of the things that people ask me all the time about UCAN, like literally including uh, during breakfast this morning, was how is it different from DIDs? And DIDs are actually inside of UCAN, right? It's not an or, it's a building block that we build UCANs out of. DIDs say who you are. They give you a public key that you can prove that this, uh, this agent, this person, this process uh, was allowed to uh, sign. And uh, UCAN say what you can do. So the distinction is a did is let's make sure I don't get these backwards, is authentication. It proves that some data is authentic. It comes from a trusted source, who you know. And uh, UCANs are authorization. They say that you're authorized to do some action. 
So here's an example uh, token uh, with the signature and header taken out. We have an issuer, which is a DID, in this case a did key, and an audience. So in this case, I'm transferring authority for the things in the cap section, which we'll look at in a second, from, say, from me to Stephen. Uh, we have some time bounds on this to say don't, this can't be used before these times and it expires at this time um, so that uh, you only give access to things in the, uh, if somebody were to say get a hold of your private key, uh, it's not a disaster now that they have access to all this stuff, right? So you follow the principle of least authority whenever possible. You can make them as long lived as you like, um, but scoping them down to just the resources that you need for a particular request and then the actual capabilities uh, themselves. Um, there can be several uh, in here. Um, we'll look at these in more detail uh, in a moment. So I mentioned a moment ago signature and header. Uh, it's a JWT by default, uh, so you also have a JWT header. Uh, in this case, it says the kind of algorithm used, and that's a JWT. You have the payload and the signature. The signature must match the did in the issuer, which is then signed over. Um, as part of the payload. So we have this guarantee that this was signed by who they claimed the issuer was. And we have proofs that say, I claim that I have access to these capabilities because somebody delegated them to me. Here are those delegations. Here's those other UCANs that I have access to. The actual capabilities, uh, again, you can have several in, in a, uh, any given UCAN. They are a, always have a resource, so it's any URI, it's the noun. So in this case, it's a uh, HTTP uh, path to Alice's photos. Then you have some verb, in this case, read access. And then you can add optional additional fields, such as uh, in this second one, uh, sending email, um, only internal to uh, fission.codes email addresses. Right? So say you can send uh, as Boris, uh, the CEO, only internally. Because we have uh, dids, we have anything, uh, uh, all, all the um, resources and tools available for PKI, right? So we don't have to send keys around anymore, right? Moving keys from one machine to another is super dangerous. Um, browsers now, all the major browsers, have non-extractable keys. So you can sign things without ever seeing the private key, obviously you see the public key, um, and without them being able to be stolen by, say, a malicious browser extension. So uh, I have my keys on these different, uh, um, different browsers, and I can use them to sign tokens, and then doing this delegation and pointing between them from issuer to audience without moving keys. So we say this is delegating authority without delegating uh, keys. I've mentioned attenuation a few times. Um, the basic idea here is when I'm delegating to somebody else, I can give them access to the capabilities that I have or fewer, right? So I can't, out of thin air, say, oh yeah, totally, I have access to that database. I would have to have some proof that I have access to it to give it to them. So here's Alice. Alice has a bunch of capabilities represented by these various icons. Here's Bob. Uh, Bob has a desktop. And she's going to delegate absolutely everything to him, right? Maybe he, he helps her out with stuff. Um, he also has a phone that maybe he trusts less, so he doesn't uh, need to delegate absolutely everything to his phone. So it's not just about the individual person, right? It's any agent. It's from phones to laptops to servers, right? You can move straight through those. Bob from his phone delegates to uh, Carol here, who only gets the one um, the one capability at the end. And these all are proven in this chain with those proofs, which are just CIDs for, um, for the previous you can. Now, it doesn't have to be a linear chain like this. We can branch at any point and give a different subset um, of capabilities to somebody else. They can further subdelegate that, and you can also take from multiple sources, and they don't have to be rooted in the same user like they are here, but you know, from multiple sources, and bring them together to say, well, I can actually compose together uh, rainbow and dog, uh, everybody's favorite capabilities. The other advantage is this doesn't care where it lives anymore, right? We're not waiting and looking at, you know, is it in this database, is it in that database, do I have to talk to this one, do I have to talk to that one? It's just everything's in the token itself, so it doesn't care which application it's powering. 
it can go from a messaging app to uh, doing analysis to spreadsheets to just sitting on somebody's uh, CLI, uh, you know, doing individual uh, tasks. It doesn't care, it can move straight through all of those. So it lets you compose applications as well. Revocation, so let's say that uh, uh, Bob discovers that uh, Carol's laptop was stolen uh, and doesn't want to have uh, all those, you know, this capability uh, in use in the wild by uh, some malicious person. He can issue a revocation by CID. Um, and as long as he's in the proof chain, he can revoke anything below that. So it doesn't have to be the very next one. It's anywhere in there. And that will revoke everything after that. Okay. These are gossiped. It is eventually consistent. So it's not that when you issue it, it's immediately done. You can send it to where they'll need to terminate that, um, uh, that invocation of the, the UCAN. So if it's, say, access to you know, some specific uh, server, say it's for Web3 storage, you could send directly to Web3 storage, hey, I'm revoking this, and then I'll gossip it to everybody else as well. Um, but because all of this is designed to also work offline, we can't uh, guarantee a strong consistency model. You can add more consistency as you need, um, but it's designed to be very flexible. It's also designed uh, so that, you know, we have these nouns and verbs, that those can be composed separately as well. URIs, there are an infinite number of them, but there's only a certain number that are registered, right? Um, you could put literally whatever string you want in there as long as it's a valid URI. Um, we think most people will only need a handful, right? Um, so by having those and then uh, a standard library of capabilities, it makes it really easy to not have to sit there and, and think like, oh, how am I gonna model this? You just say, I need one of these and one of those, I'm gonna stick them together and send it off. And now we all understand the same vocabulary. It's always extensible. You're always allowed to add more, um, but to get people started at least, this will cover sort of the 95% use case. Now I mentioned a few times now, this is all done with JWTs um, and those aren't like the hippest, coolest structure. Uh, good news, the good folks at Daghouse have solved this. There's uh, UCAN IPLD and Cacao from Ceramic um, that puts this into uh, IPLD schemas. You still have to be able to turn them into a J JWT if you want to interoperate with anybody who's adopted the standard. But if you're, say, communicating between your own servers, you can absolutely do this. The case study from before, the IPNS version, so we had this point of centralization because the key only lived in that one place. But now with UCAN, we can transfer authority without having to move keys around. So we can completely break this up. I don't even need to have an, IP, uh, an IPFS node around anymore to update records. Um, I can issue a UCAN as long as I can prove that I have uh, control over that namespace and I can gossip it through the network. And as long as those point back to this one, it all works. I can delegate access between people uh, so that it doesn't even have to be literally this machine or, or even uh, me as an individual making updates. I can share that with other people and they can make updates as needed. And this is uh, something that we're actually exploring um, at Fission for a sort of broad system uh, called uh, NNS or the, the name name system as some of you may have seen the, the talk yesterday. Um, and Daghouse also has a proposal for uh, something between this and uh, today's IPNS to get closer to this without having to throw out all of IPNS uh, in the meantime. Basically having a uh, proxy server uh, that you can uh, use UCANs and then it'll do the publishing uh, on behalf of people. We can also do uh, things like authorized data retrieval. So it's great to have encryption at rest. We do a lot of that at Fission. Um, but if you want to prevent somebody from even asking for something over the network, because it's always better to keep something off the network, uh, you can also uh, model that with UCAN uh, and ask for that even, uh, I think now it's actually even implemented in BitSwap, you can put that in a BitSwap header. Uh, if any of you saw uh, Philip's talk uh, the day before yesterday, I think, uh, this is also baked in deeply into the web native file system, so all of the write access in WinFS uh, is managed with this and it powers uh, a bunch of apps uh, today, including uh, the one that I showed earlier, the uh, sort of Dropbox um, uh, clone on IPFS called uh, uh, Fission Drive. 
we are building all kinds of stuff out of this, so uh, authorized uh, channels. So if you want to have a group uh, chat or set up uh, gossip between uh, collaborating peers that are working on some shared resource like uh, a database or you know, a group chat, uh, you can use this to say, hey, look, we all have a shared capability. We're gonna join a group together and use that to prove that they should be allowed into the, uh, into the secure uh, channel. We had built this out of uh, originally uh, the double ratchet from Signal, um, but good news, uh, messaging layer security from the IETF just got approved, and so we can uh, plug this in directly uh, into the uh, authorization portion of MLS, and it just works. We need to go back and update the spec, because this was literally last week, I think, that they it finally got the thumbs up. Um, but the actual flow, otherwise, in that spec, basically looks the same. And uh, if uh, you can't get enough of you can today, uh, come back in the afternoon and uh, we'll talk about how we're using this to power uh, decentralized compute as well, um, including uh, interesting things like doing distributed pipelines um, and collaborating processes uh, dynamically. So, uh, some final resources to leave you with. If uh, you're interested in, or want to get involved, there's the uh, UCAN community. We run monthly community calls. Uh, we have a Discord. Um, we, uh, it's an open process. Anyone can get involved. We have a bunch of implementations. They're not uh, all in the same version, uh, unfortunately. The, the main implementation these days are uh, Rust and the TypeScript ones. Um, we also have some early work with passkeys, which is the new uh, Apple, Google, Microsoft uh, key syncing uh, system, works in browsers, et cetera. You can basically authenticate with your fingerprint. Um, so we can sign UCANs with those. Uh, MetaMask as well, uh, we've done some work with that. And if you wanna add to this list of implementations, uh, let us know and we'll even get you a, a cute sticker uh, mascot. If you wanna go deeper into capabilities, uh, Capabilities Myths Demolished is a great paper. ACLs don't. Uh, the eWrites website, so Mark Miller's website, does lots of writing about this um, for, for quite a while. It's a fantastic resource. Uh, and uh, if you're uh, interested in sort of more of the, you know, have, where have people tried to do this before, uh, in the late 90s, the Simple Public Key Infrastructure, or Spooky, uh, group uh, did a lot of this. They didn't have all the, uh, uh, the same pieces that we have today, uh, so it wasn't uh, as successful. They had a hard time, for example, with revocation. Um, that we now have the tools for literally the computer science and the networks to do. Uh, later today, uh, Iraqli will be giving a workshop on uh, getting started with UCAN. If you wanna do something uh, from home, there's UCAN.lol, uh, which is put together by Brian, um, which is a uh, plain text getting started with UCAN game. And we have UCAN.xyz, which is a token explorer. You can paste a token in um, it'll break it apart for you and show you here's the, uh, uh, here's who's making the claim, here's the, what their, uh, which capabilities allows, um, and you can even explore the proofs. So the whole proof tree, you can go and click through uh, dynamically and explore that. So uh, thank you, uh, and that's the QR code for the community group, and uh, I have stickers, so does Boris. Uh, come find us if you want any of those. Thanks. To uh, create one of these, you need to know the public key uh, did for whoever you're sending it to. What is the system that gets carried through? Uh, how do you discover right. the public Right, how do you keys? discover it? Yeah, uh, so by default, uh, it only uh, supports uh, did key and did pkh, same basic thing, which are the public keys. Uh, you can also do, as long as your collaborators understand other did methods, uh, you can have other ones that are more um, semantic. So you can give, you know, based on a username, things like that, right, in, in the did method. Um, but yeah, uh, you absolutely need to know who you're, you're pointing it at. Um, so this is one of the things that we hope to solve in the name name system. So you could give somebody's email and it would look up for you because uh, underneath it's all you can. So it would be able to find, hey, here's their, um, their claimed uh, did. You can also use things like did DNS. So if somebody says, uh, I'm you know, alice at example.com, uh, it can go and look up from the DNS record, there's a text record in there that gives you the did key, for example. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, one more question. Uh, so I presume the proofs need to be public so that other people can travel them. Mm -hmm. Where do those get saved? Mm. Uh, so they actually don't have to be public. Uh, you can put it entirely over uh, private channels as well. Um, so one way of managing that is you can pack them into a car file and ship them around. And then once they're, um, like let's say that you're just collaborating between a small number of parties, once they have them, they, can, they have them cached, you don't have to send them again, right? Um, we had this, uh, well, have this running over IPFS, so they all have CIDs, right? Uh, you can pass them around as car files, you can put them in HTTP headers. There's, uh, in the UCAN working group, there's a whole spec on how to do this purely in HTTP headers without any decentralized tech at all. Gotcha, thanks. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I ask a question at the end of everything, but I am a huge capability fan. I mean, one of the things we, 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 we support the foundation is the uh, Sprightly Institute that's doing OCAP. And, and so with, with kind of a uh, kind of inside baseball thing, I'm interested in how you might think of OCAP, which is a sort of, uh, an, uh, I guess, an RPC kind of protocol to, to, uh, that uses capabilities and how these might fit together. Because um, I know that's, that's going through a kind of pre-standards process. And I guess, Related to that, you talked a little bit about eventual consistency mm -hmm. and revocation. Mm -hmm. um, definitely something in sort of Mark Miller's sort of uh, uh, the historical view of this is you have this sort of proxy, right? Mm -hmm. Where you go, I can, um, I can ask for this permission, but it's going through something that can kind of mediate in real time uh, whether this should be rejected. And I was wondering if that is, is that is that something that fits into the UCAN space, or is UCAN more static than that? Yeah, uh, both fantastic questions. Uh, so uh, on OCAPN, we're part of this OCAPN standardization process. So this is all OCAPN compatible, or it will be when that's a finalized spec, right? So this, this will all work together. Um, something Mark uh, has been very vocal about in, in that process is that it shouldn't, there shouldn't be an OCAPN token. There should be a bunch of them that are just different representations of the same ideas, right? And so you can, uh, and say, um, uh, uh, ZCAP, for example. Um, there's some differences, but the overlap is quite large. And so we can interoperate between those as long as both clients understand both, right? Yeah. Um, the second question was about uh, revocation. So you're, you're absolutely right. This actually isn't full-blown full blown OCAPs. Um, you can bootstrap up into them, but this is uh, PK, uh, SPKI, or Spooky. So uh, there's, I think actually in Capabilities Myths Demolished, I think, uh, they have a comparison chart that says, you know, uh, how, how far along this road are you? And Spooky is the step before. So uh, the reason that we need that is everything, at least for our use case, has to work offline and be highly cacheable. Um, you can put it into a mode, like you could use them in a way where you don't have revocation and you do have this proxy system, which is awesome. But the, um, in sort of classic OCAPs, you have fail stop. So if that proxy goes down, even if there's a network partition, you can't do anything and you always have to make these round trip network requests. Um, one way of looking at you can, this is getting a little bit in the weeds, is you can think of it almost like a set of instructions or like an AST that you're gonna execute um, when somebody reads the token to say this is the intention as long as there isn't a revocation. So, and it's been interesting talking to people like um, uh, Alan Karp and, and some others about the differences and we're kind of exploring this sort of uh, less discovered space now that we have some of these newer tools versus the last time with uh, the original Spooky implementations. Um, firstly, fantastic slides. <laughs> Those are <laughs> some you. of the best I've seen. Uh, could you talk more through the revocation process and how that would work? So if I, for example, delegate authority to some capabilities to you and you in turn delegate it to someone malicious, mm -hmm. how would I, so yeah, I'm, I'm the first link in that tree and I want to revoke access to the ones that are marked there. How does that propagate through the, the entire tree? Yeah. Uh, uh, Fantastic question. So there's a specific format where you say, uh, here's my DID, here's the token that I'm revoking, and here's a signature over that. Um, you can't unrevoke something, so it's a one-way operation, right? Um, and as soon as somebody receives that, uh, 
up until the point that the token is valid for us, because we have that time expiration, uh, they cache the CID of it, and if they see it in any proof chain, it's not uh, considered a valid proof, right? Um, it doesn't have to, uh, it's not that you're revoking the first thing that you delegated, it might be something further down in the chain, and so you can target anything that you're in the proof chain for, and say, yeah, that one down there, like, I like this person, I like this person, but not them, they can't have this anymore. Um, so I have a question which I know many people have been wondering over the course of this conference, which is who designs all of your wonderful stickers? <laughs> uh, that, that is Bruno. Uh, he, um, uh, we had him on sort of like a, a sticker retainer basically for a while, and we eventually just hired him. He's fantastic. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. <laughs>